butter and egg man, honey. Oh, goody, goody, goody. But I'm different. I'm from way down in the south. That's just what I'm looking for. Ooh. You sure you're lying? Nah. I'll buy you all the jewelry that wool worth the money. Uh oh, that did it, that did it. If you just put your arms around me and it sort of call me honey. Gotta do it, gotta do it. Now I'll buy you a real sharp fire. Solid, I can stand one right now. Providing what you told me the other day, just don't change your mind. Never have, never have. Executive Director of the National Public Housing Museum, the first cultural institution in the United States dedicated to telling the story of public housing in so the United States, and does. also passionately committed to preserving, interpreting, and propelling the right of all people to a place to call home. I want to begin with a land recognition. Um, oh, Chicago is the traditional home, home of the Three Fires Confederacy, which includes the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi people. Chicago was also first settled here by Jean-Baptiste du Sable with the help of his extraordinary wife, Kitty Hawa, who was also a Potawatomi woman. Um, leading up to the Black um, Hawks War of 1832 and then the Chicago Treaty of 1833. Many indigenous people were forcibly killed and also removed um, from these territories that they called home. And then, almost a century later, under different governmental policies called the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, many indigenous people were once again coerced to move back to the urban centers that their ancestors had been dispossessed from. As a museum professional, as a historian, and just as a human being, I strive to honor this history and to reparate this history um, and uh, really remember that there are also still 65,000 indigenous people who live in the urban metropolitan area that call Chicago home. Uh, thank you so much. And so, um, so we are here in my kitchen. This is really Lisa's kitchen. We're yep. really here. And in person. not only is Eve viewing here, but 102 year old Timuel Black is here as well. Yay! <laughs> the man himself. Um, he gets to sit and wait while we're going to cook. Yes. So Eve and I are going to prepare Louis Armstrong's favorite dish, red beans and rice. And we have our ingredients here, and we're going to actually um, begin to sort of prepare. Eve, can yeah, you grab a yeah. sort of yeah. knife? Um, Eve is going to actually chop, washed, uh, no, wash it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> She's going to chop the green pepper and the onion and throw it into the pot of red beans that I've had soaking overnight. 
Um, and as she does that, we're going to be back with you in a second, but we're actually going to send it over to two of our wonderful board members of National Public Housing Museum who are going to formally welcome you tonight. So Sunny Fisher and Deborah Bent. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here at the National Public Housing Museum's annual benefit. My name is Sunny Fisher, and I have the privilege and the pleasure of serving as NPHM's chair. I want to welcome you all to this exciting night with the legendary Timuel Black, the extraordinary Eve L. Ewing, and the brilliant National Public Housing Museum Executive Director, Lisa Yoon Lee. My name is Deborah Bennett and I'm thrilled to support tonight's event and serve on the board of directors of the National Public Housing Museum. I grew up in public housing in the East Chester projects in the Bronx, and I know personally how important public housing has been to me, to my family, and to millions of others. When I recorded my oral history for the NPHM's archive of public housing stories, I realized that the museum's efforts are creating a much more inclusive foundation for the stories that our nation preserves and interprets and disseminates. I did not grow up in public housing, but believe strongly in the museum's mission to preserve, promote, and propel the right of all people to a place where they can live and prosper, a place to call home. The museum's mission reflects the vision and passion of residents but also preservationists, scholars, artists, civic leaders, and social justice activists who believe in the importance of community-centered work that can address housing insecurity through the vibrancy of arts, culture, and innovative public policy. Your contribution tonight supports our work as a site of conscience, drawing on the power of place and memory to link the past with today's and tomorrow's most urgent social issues. For example, I know my donation leverages the history of innovative entrepreneurship that has been a strategy of surviving and thriving for public housing residents, low-income people, and communities of color. The National Public Housing Museum Entrepreneurship Hub supports a new generation of small businesses and cooperatives, inclu including a museum store that will be a cooperative owned with public housing residents. Your gift also helps us engage artists, gather those oral histories from not only in Chicago, but across the nation and internationally. And it honors the history of public housing residents. Your gift creates innovative art and cultural programming and the public policy reform that reimagines the future of our communities, our societies, and the places we call home. Thank you all for joining us tonight. If you've already made a contribution, we are so grateful. Special thanks go out to the host for tonight's event on the next screen. If you'd like to make an additional gift or enter now for a chance to win one of our fabulous cooking experiences, use the information that follows. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a very nice evening. Welcome back to the kitchen with me and Eve. Um, we just want to let you know that if thank you so much for those who have already donated to National Public Housing Museum and for those of you who have not yet donated, but on those of you who are interested in giving us a little more, you can see the donate button, which is right below here. All right, so we are in the kitchen. Sure are. And I think it's one of the most important, if not the most important rooms in the house. Now, there are other rooms, right? Like the bedroom, etc. Eve, what do you think? What is the most important room in a home? Obviously, it's the kitchen. I mean, the kitchen is, it like symbolically represents sustenance. It represents bringing families together, bringing friends together. It's a, it's a participatory room, right? Because you can bring people in the kitchen and have them dice an onion or do something. And that's why it's the place where people naturally congregate over time, regardless of how little you actually want them there when you might be hosting. <laughs> so obviously the kitchen is the spot. No, I agree. It's I might I might start crying about it, actually. That's how oh. passionately I feel as I'm chopping this onion. That's right. Eve is chopping a whole onion, which we're about to put into the pot. And we just had a mini debate about how many garlic cloves to put in. Yes, I asked Lisa how many cloves of garlic. She said one, which is 
unacceptable. <laughs> There's no such thing as a good recipe with a single clove of garlic. So one to me is like a strong three or four. So that's what we're going to do. So she, but I said one, Eve goes, okay, four. Yeah. Um, but it's also because I just watched this recipe being made by Mrs. Armstrong, AKA Lucille Armstrong. And she wooed Louis Armstrong with red beans and rice. And on that um, television show, she said, I hate garlic, so she only puts one clove of garlic. Oh no. I know, and she said she actually would tie a piece of dental floss to the garlic so that she could easily fish it out before mm. she served it as well. Very clever. Now, Louis Armstrong, who is arguably one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, was also known as one of the greatest eaters of the 20th century. And this is one of his absolute favorite dishes. And he would sign his letters um, and any kind of correspondence that he had with uh, red beans and ricely Louis Armstrong, <laughs> which is so sweet. And we really thank also the Louis Armstrong House Museum um, up in the Bronx in New York, where they've preserved many of his recipes and also his home. And it's like a sister house museum to us, the National Public Housing Museum. And so I want to encourage everybody to also go see that house museum one point now i know that tim black actually met louis armstrong and so i want to ask tim to tell us the story of when you met louis armstrong tim can you tell the story of when you met louis armstrong it, well very early on we i used to be a teenager <laughs> we teenagers began to love jazz music, though our parents at home, because they had fled the South to get a better life, and their intention was to behave like white folks as much as possible. But at home, we were also uh, introduced to blues, Bessie Smith, Mamie Smith, and jazz. And we heard that there was a young man who had been invited by the brand at the theater, I think Fletcher Henderson or one of those early, to be in a band, and his name was Louis Armstrong. Well, my father took my brother and I to a neighborhood that ordinarily we wouldn't travel at 30, in the, in the 300 block on State Street. And I forget the name of the theater. And we heard this young man blowing that horn in an unimaginable way. Mm -hmm. Now, I learned later that Louis Armstrong did not have music as a, he didn't learn it from school, he just learned it from listening. And it was so unusual that I was, I was absolutely thrilled. I, only, I, I was in elementary school. And from that point on, Louis Armstrong become one of my favorite because he, the fact that he didn't learn music formally, he could play whatever he felt like playing and creatively. And that's the reason that Fletcher Henderson or who were the band sent to New Orleans to bring Louis Armstrong to Chicago which would create for his band 
another attraction because most of the members of that band, though they played jazz, they were classically trained. And Louis didn't have to obey any rules because he didn't know them. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Um, and I love how... That's the background that I came into, the reverence. Now, later, I got to know him because, <laughs> because he was a friend of the father of, I forget their name, of two of my classmates. And Louis, when he would be in town, would come by to see Mr. Smith. Mm. He'd come by to see me. And us young people would round up around 51st and carry him at in Chicago. And Louis would tell us how to behave hmm. in order to be successful. Ooh. It's the sound of the rice cooker. Let Does me that get it. help to understand how I got to know Louis? 100%. And later, when he married Lil Armstrong, his second wife, I got to know her better, though Louis and, and Lil. And later, I had her uh, as a guest at Hyde Park High School mm. when I was teaching there. Mm. Wonderful. That's amazing. I'm definitely tearing up. It might be the emotions or it might be the onions, but uh, I definitely, something is happening to my face. I know. So I, started, ready to, I started steaming up started a little bit too. Yourself. Yes. Yes. I know. I also just love the story of how, I mean, Tim is such a great storyteller, as are you, but also just how the foundation of great storytelling is listening mm -hmm. and how what all these great people like Louis and Tim and are just at the core also amazing listeners um, but I also forgot because I, I'm not a professional chef I forgot to mention that these beans that we are There's actually cooking beans. they're red beans they're actually from the Camellia brand we're not giving me a paid placement but they <laughs> actually are from New Orleans and so wow. and they're actually different kinds of red beans and Louis Armstrong preferred kidney beans so that's the one that we're making uh, for you today and what we're gonna do now is take those red beans it's around a pound of beans and Eve is gonna put the onions the four cloves of garlic and the green pepper into the pot I'm gonna cover it with water and then we're gonna put it onto the stove to boil and then lightly simmer all right cool An another part of my knowledge of Louis was during World War two when we had one almost broken. Louis was a favorite of the Russians. Mm. The Soviet Union, I met him. Well, I knew him, so I met him. He was talking about, they were talking about everything. Louis was talking with his friends, his Russian friend, about music, jazz music. <laughs> and that he was a individual who cross race lines, gender lines, and all the other things that separate us. Mm -hmm. Do it, I might make myself fairly clear. Very clear, very clear. That sounds like such a familiar story because there are so many black artists who during the time when they were disrespected in the United States got the respect that they deserve across the pond because they recognized their, their artistry. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, writers, singers, dancers. Um, yeah. I was so proud. And in Moscow, when I walked in to the place where Louis was playing, he said, oh, there's TD. <laughs> My earlier initials, Timuel Dixon Black. TD, but I, some people later said, too damn black. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I knew that story of your initials being TD. That's the first time I ever heard it. 
I earlier asked my husband, Adam, who had started his early life as a jazz historian, like why was Louis Armstrong called Satchmo? And that also is because it's short for Satchel Mouth. Mouth. Yeah. yeah, because he had such his big cheeks. Yeah. To put food and also to blow the music. All right, so now I'm going to actually pour water just to cover the beans. And I, I want to also say that I've actually earlier made some. Don't break the magic of tea, Lisa. <laughs> I'm breaking the magic of the <laughs> webinar. But the reason I'm saying that is because in the other one, I actually used ham hocks and also bacon. Oh, yeah. And I, you put that in there, and then you just sort of let it boil and simmer for a long, long time, and it's so delicious. And but you, I'm also, you know what I was thinking? Because my husband doesn't eat ham, he doesn't eat pork. I was <gasps> thinking turkey necks would probably be a pretty good uh, substitution. Uh, Miss Zenobia looks a little dubious off camera, but I think <laughs> if you want to make these red beans and rice and you don't, you don't eat pork or somebody you love doesn't eat pork, I think turkey necks or turkey smoked turkey wings might be a decent, decent substitute. Yes, I want to say that um, Mrs. Nobia Jonathan Black is here also, you know, in the distance. And the very first thing she did when she walked into the kitchen, she lifted the lid. She said, yes, ham hocks. Those are my favorite. <laughs> so you got to do ham hocks. You got to do ham yeah. hocks. So I'm going to actually put this onto the stove. When I was a kid, I used to call the John Hancock building the John Ham Hock building. Ooh, Any of you can call it that. If you Maybe that's the real name. Who <laughs> really knows? Um... So let me, I want to, like, everybody to get to know you all a little bit better. Um, and in your books, now you have, I think, do you have four books? That yeah, you've written, sure. Right? Like yeah, that. yeah. Like Electric <laughs> Arches, which is so amazing. Um, Night, uh, the Ghost in the Schoolyard is my second book in 1919. And then my fourth book, Maya and the Robot, which is for young readers, is coming out uh, next month in July, July 13th. And then I've written a lot of comic books that they put together into one book. So I love yeah. how Eve just casually drops that. I mean, it was <laughs> like when Eve's Iron Heart came out, it was everyone had, I mean, some of the accolades was just like the most anticipated Marvel oh, thank comic you. ever. Yes. Thank you. But so much of your writing is so visceral. It is about like sound and sight and everything like that. And I was just wondering, like, what, what, how does like sense actually play into your writing? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the you know, some of that comes from poetry. So in poetry, our job is to get people to pay attention to small moments that they wouldn't think about otherwise, and that has a lot to do with senses. But you know, we live our life through our senses. I mean, I'm I'm in here right now anticipating the dinner that we're gonna have because it smells like delicious food and ingredients. And it's also how we pause and take a moment to connect with other people. So I think in order to be a good storyteller, you do have to be able to really tap into your senses and stop to pay attention to the things that other people wouldn't notice. And that's how you bring a story to life. Like even as you know, um, Tim was telling his story um, about meeting Louis Armstrong, I was just thinking about the sound of the, the big band, right, and the sound of the jazz music and the hall that has the acoustics to amplify everything, and then what it must have felt like to walk in and have Louis Armstrong call you out by name, right? Those are the, the details that make for good storytelling. So it also makes for good cooking. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, we're curating the permanent exhibition at the National Public Housing Museum, which will be in the last remaining building of the Jane Addams Homes. And I always find sometimes history, historical sites and history museums so forget all of the senses. Yeah. It's just about what people Reading. see right, and read. And actually, when you go into the archives, as you know, and you're reading about a historical moment, it is always people are talking about the smells and like how they felt. Right. It's a, about being a sentient human being. And so one of the things that we are hoping to do at the museum is really engage everybody in all of their senses. Not like the Disney way, which is like, you know, <laughs> in four days, water sprays and stuff like I that. I wouldn't be mad at that, to be honest. But I do think that that's, you know, it's our senses that attach us to a sense of, of place, you know, and we all, if you think about your grandparents' house or, you know, the car that your parents got when you were a kid, you, you, you remember those sensory details. Yeah. That's yeah. what makes it real. Now, let me ask you and Tim a question. So the National Public Housing Museum has a project called 36 Questions for Civic Love. And it's 36 questions that we developed that can bring two strangers into relationship with one another, critical generosity, and develop sort of an understanding of where people have come from. From And it has like questions which begin with, what's the first sound you hear in the morning, to mm -hmm. 
is there under what conditions would you call the police on a neighbor, right? So one of the questions in that series of 36 questions is, what is your favorite kitchen smell? So I want to ask that to you. Oh, I have so many. Can I cheat? Okay, yeah, I'm sure. gonna say I'm gonna say three. Uh, one is my my grandparents have a kitchen where everything is very, is wood. So I can smell this when I smell like cedar wood. It makes me think of my grandparents' kitchen, uh, where my grandfather used to have me look out the window at the bird feeder and count how many different types of birds I saw. And then my second is a tie between basil and cilantro, which are what? both just oh, really good. That is yeah. really weird. Those are my faves. Weird. Interesting. All right, let's ask Tim. Right. So I'm gonna come over here. Tim, what's your favorite kitchen smell? What's the secret to it? No. What's your favorite kitchen smell? Oh, I, I've eaten so many things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in 102 no, years. <laughs> but I think chitterlings. Wow, hey, a chitterlings <laughs> fan. And fried chicken. Mm. Yes. And I French cooking the various things. So I have appetite that is universal in terms of consuming food, so it's hard for me to describe any one thing. Um, That's pretty good. But Fried chicken is a good one. Yeah. In an individual way, chitterlings, and we call them chitterlings, yes. was a favorite on holidays, families would celebrate the holiday, African American families, by having fried chicken and chitterlings, chitterlings, and and spaghetti and and some form of 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 of. of Things that that they enjoyed. Yes. So, having lived a long time, I have had the opportunity to. to but those are the early and continuous things that I enjoy very much, <laughs> because it one. not only tastes good, but it brings back memories of my younger years. I used to be younger. <laughs> <laughs> and and inspires me to and feel that I have a responsibility to share just not my history, human history, with younger people. Amen. That food is a part and music is a very important part of keeping hope alive yes. and moving forward. Yes. Yep. Amen. Yep. You know, chitlins, that's one of my earliest food memories, although I have to say mine is a little bit more traumatic than Tim's because I remember being, my mom was making chitlins, but I didn't know that. And I was probably about this high, I was maybe like six or seven. And I remember coming up to the sink and seeing a big bucket of something but I couldn't see what it was. So I reached up and I looked in and my eyes got about this big. And uh, that's my earliest chitlin memory. And it's, it's a, I was shook. <laughs> I was shook, but, but, I, but I do get down with some fried chicken. If you talk with your older relatives, you will find similar stories. Yes. To what I have just told. Yes, similar, it's true. Wherever they may have been. And that carries the idea and the challenge that life goes on. Keep on keeping on. Mm -hmm. yep. Trouble Amen. don't last always. Amen. Yep. And so that the spirituality of life that your ancestors, my ancestors, Carry it so that you could be here. That's right. <laughs> yep, that's right. That's right. 
Now, um, everyone who's out there, I want to let you know that we are going to do a raffle tonight for two extraordinary prizes, and I want to thank um, my good friends and also just people who inspire me all the time. Sam Cass, who um, was a food policy uh, chef and also the person who developed the White House uh, Victory Garden with First Lady Michelle Obama. He's agreed to do a cooking class with my also amazing good friend Tara Lane, um, who is a great chef and a cultural activist. Um, and so that's one of the prizes that we're auctioning off. And then also the amazing uh, Beverly Kim and Johnny Clark, of uh, who've won Michelin awards and also James Beard prizes, and who have a beautiful restaurant called Parachute. They've also agreed to do a cooking class with you and 10 of your friends on Zoom. And so we're going to be auctioning that off. Um, not auctioning. We should raffle. Have. We should. We should. We're, we're, not year, yeah, year. we're also not allowed to use the word raffle because yeah, it's sorry, an Illinois state, state of Illinois. It's a giveaway. It's a giveaway. So a we're, doing, we're doing a randomly giveaway. selected giveaway later. And so for every person who donates, then you can be in this giveaway. And um, so it's going to close very soon. So this is your last chance to actually participate in the giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> and so please do that now. And um, before we come back and sort of scoop the rice and start sit down and eat and talk about oral history a little bit, I'm going to actually send you over to hear from National Public Housing Museum's amazing director of public programs, arts, culture, and public policy. She does the work that links all forms of accountability, like the giving of accounts, the keeping of accounts and also moral accountability in all of our public programs. I love her. She's an amazing poet. She's just an amazing human being. Her name is Tiff Beatty. Yay, Tiff! Yay, Tiff! I'm going to send you over to her now. Good evening. My name is Tiff Beatty, and I'm the program director of arts, culture, and public policy at the National Public Housing Museum. I'm so excited to talk to you a bit today about some of the museum's recent and upcoming programs and how our asset-based approach and innovative collaborations with artists, designers, students, scholars, and most importantly, residents, helps us to create a more inclusive foundation for the stories we preserve, promote, and interpret. Our oral history methodologies in particular have been crucial to our efforts to not only collect the history of public housing, but also to develop a people-centered approach to match our social justice mission. For example, at home, ephemeral monuments to public housing residents was a temporary art exhibit designed in partnership with Studio Brazen and lead designer Lauren Miranda. The exhibit took the form of a projection installation, serving as an ephemeral monument to the everyday lives and stories of public housing residents. From the beginning, we sought out the insights and leadership of Shakira Johnson, a former public housing resident who is now the museum's first full-time oral historian. Shakira worked with other MPHM staff and residents to collect, curate, and plan the exhibit. You will hear from Shakira in just a bit. But first, I'd like to share a moving video from one of our community members, Shalanda McIntosh, who currently lives in the Cabrini Green development in Chicago. In this clip, Shalanda shares her impressions of what the exhibit and the opportunity to share her story meant to her. As you'll hear, the development of the at-home exhibit also overlap with our ongoing work with public housing resident entrepreneurs. This work as a part of the museum's entrepreneurship hub supports a resident-led working group committed to building a museum store cooperative to be owned and operated by former and current residents like Shalanda. Affectionately called the eHub, this unique program is designed to leverage what we recognize as one of our community's most valuable resources the history of innovative and cooperative entrepreneurship that has been used as a strategy of surviving and thriving for public housing residents, low-income people, and communities of color. I hope this short clip just provides a glimpse into some of the ways we are leveraging our archive and artists to convene our community with care, curiosity, and radical generosity. The full video is available on the MPHM website and YouTube, along with videos from most of our recent programming, including our most recent program, Notice Inequity for Sale, which served to launch as the uh, served as the official launch of a new project by Chicago-based visual artist Tanika Lewis Johnson, MPHM's 2021 Artist as Instigator. 
and equity for sale is an artistic critical exploration of racist real estate practices using land sale contracts in Chicago's greater Inglewood neighborhood during the 50s and 60s. The project will demonstrate how these contracts directly contribute to the racial wealth gap and present day disinvestment in black communities. An equity for sale will comprise 10 to 15 life-size landmarkers installed in the neighborhood, a website documenting the stories of this period of plunder, and a self-guided walking tour connecting this history with present day conditions in Greater Inglewood. Also, check out Silent Voices Among Us, a montage of Chicago's West Side, an exhibition featuring the photography and oral history of historian Dr. Cranston Knight a former resident of the Henry Horner homes, along with the oral histories of other Henry Horner residents and maps of the mapping COVID-19 project. Thank you for your time and interest in learning about the museum's programming. Look forward to seeing you at the next event. My name is Shalonda McIntosh. I live in Cabernet Green. It was beautiful. It's speechless. Um, just to know that my voice is heard. Um, to know that it, 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 it means a lot. Um, it's love, it's uh, compassion, it's touching at the same time. Um, whew, it's wonderful, marvelous. Just to know that the museum is like, it's, it'll connect us all. It don't make, make a difference what development you're from. All of us share the same common goals. All of us want something bigger and different in life. Uh, we had candy stores in every development. We had people that did hair in every development. We had entrepreneurs in every development. We had issues in every household. And everybody got along. Everybody was family. Everybody played, everybody looked out for each other. And just to know that it's sitting right here, this museum, it gives everybody that never lived there a look onto what really happened there, how they really can see it instead of viewing us from a different point of view. Hi, my name is Shakira Johnson, and I am the assistant educator and oral historian at the National Public Housing Museum. The National Public Housing Museum's Oral History Archive, which currently holds over 150 stories from across the country, is the largest collection of stories of current and former public housing residents. As a former resident of the Henry Horner Homes and a contributor to the archive myself, I know firsthand the significance of challenging preconceptions, myths, and stereotypes of life in public housing. I also know how important it is to expand the public's understanding of the importance of housing by sharing our experiences. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, our oral history program has adapted to keep narrators and oral historians safe. Now on Zoom, I get to meet and spend time with past and present public housing residents from all walks of life who live all over the country. I get to ask questions about their life histories and listen to their stories, which I record and add to the archive. We also share excerpts in our monthly audio listening series out of the archives, which I encourage you all to listen to on our website and we are planning to include ways for you all to access the archive in the next year. Finally, I'd like to share a few minutes of a recent oral history I recorded with Daphne Rose Sanchez from Cooper Park, an apartment complex that is part of New York City's Housing Authority. When I asked her to share a story that embodies her life in public housing, I was amazed by her response. I hope you find it as impactful as we do. Here at the National Public Housing Museum, we believe everyday stories from people like you and me matter just as much. Thank you again for your continued support of my work and your support of our community. So if you could share uh, one story that you would like others to know that embodies your experience in public housing, what would that be? Um, I can share one story that embodies my experience in public housing, like going through the little box. <laughs> It's also when I was going through the Rolodex a couple of meetings ago and they were like, what's a Rolodex? And I was like, oh man, I'm old. <laughs> um, I would say, there's so many. 
There's so many experiences, but one experience that will embody my relationship with public housing, I would say would be um, after Hurricane Andy. Um, as I mentioned, my parents bought a house. I, I had my apartment and so I was living in my apartment and this, this apartment that you're seeing behind you and it's very dear to me because I grew up in it. I visited my parents the day of Hurricane Sandy and we got eight feet of water. We were on the roof and we had to get rescued by boat. So we, we didn't think we were going to make it to be completely honest. Like my parents um, are religious and so they did a religious prayer you know, saying, you know, this is it. Thank you for our family. And I remember being so angry. So I was like, this is why you're not supposed to leave public housing. Um, but anyways, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that after that, we got, we, we spent eight hours. We, it was eight feet of water. Um, we were on the roof. It was completely dark. We got rescued by boat. The island, they were in Staten Island. So that place was quarantined for two days. And then we were able to, I, you know, I told my parents to come to my apartment. And the sense of relief as like, this is, a, this is a safe haven was so important to me at that time. And it was, a, it was a key moment in me thinking about what this place was. It was my home, it was my culture, but it was also literally my life and my parents' life and my family's life. And I will never forget how I felt walking through that door, like walking through my apartment door thinking, oh my gosh, this place literally is a, a, a safe haven for us. Um, which is why I don't want to ever leave it, but I also like know I will have to leave it the moment that I um, am able to get more funding. <laughs> so it is very bittersweet. Um, and I'm like, you know, I, I, want, <laughs> I want us to, to be able to, as a society value the home that we have they right? value it because it it has so many memories it has so many stories it's a part of so many so much culture my uh, my dad likes to show off um and it's not even his yearbook but my my dad likes to show off my uncle's ex-girlfriend's yearbook because jay-z's in it because he went to my like they went to middle school together and he's like oh look so it's like funny things like that that's just so ridiculous and I'm like dad you've never met him and you didn't go to school with him my aunt like my my aunt went to school with him so just stop saying that to people um but it's just so important and so critical like what public housing and what NYCHA and what the projects means to everyone and to me um and as we're seeing the conversation of housing really focus on real estate and square footage I think I feel like we are forgetting that there are people and their experiences and their cultures and I am always grateful for that for for my experiences and it is it is ingrained in my DNA because my family has lived in public housing for so long um, and it is something that I've always valued and cherished and I and it hit me like a brick that night <laughs> Like when I mean the night we came back to my apartment. Go. Thank you so much, Shakira and Tiff and all of the public housing residents that make our programming possible. By the way, red beans. Well, that's okay. We've actually started eating already, so I just want to show you my finished pot of red beans and rice, which have been on the stove for like the last five hours. And um, the special trick of Lucille Armstrong was to add a can of tomato paste at the end to bring the red color back. Because when you soak the beans, sometimes they start to look a little bit brown. And so you have like this pot of brown beans and rice. It doesn't look so good. Um, yeah, let's put this over here. So we are sitting at the table and magically we are joined by the wonderful Zenobia Black, yay! <laughs> um, and Zenobia has, uh, is a longtime activist um, for housing issues and for advocating for residents. And she also is on the founding National Public Housing Museum Board. So we're super happy that she's joining us here for dinner. Um, I also just wanna say one thing about the rice because I actually make rice in a rice cooker 
which is the way that many Asian Americans <laughs> make their rice. That was a little ding 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 that you heard earlier. <laughs> and the other thing that I learned that was so, so sweet is that um, next to red beans and rice, Chinese food was Louis Armstrong's mm. favorite food. And he always sought out a Chinese restaurant, whether he was in Moscow or if he was in Nigeria. And so like he has menus from Chinese restaurants from all across the globe. And so I thought that was just like a sweet, it's sweet kind of a story. cool thing to collect. Yeah. Tim, you were about to say something about red beans and rice. Was it? Yes, you were. Was it? What were you going to say about red beans? You were going to say something about red beans and rice. Oh. That was a favorite dish in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a very favorite dish in New Orleans. It is. How does it taste? Very good. Yes! Exactly! <laughs> it came out really good. It came out really good. Awesome. And then the other thing is I also made cornbread. my very special cornbread, which is a secret recipe that <laughs> Sam Cass and other people have been trying to get this recipe from me for a really long time. I finally gave it to Tara. But in any case, um, you know, maybe I'll give the recipe out to some of you viewers out we there. Probably, yeah. Depending, yes. Um, but let me tell you, the giveaway is now over yeah. for our people who, you know, thank you so much for supporting us. And how we're going to do the 21st century giveaway is I'm actually going to ask Eve and Tim to say one number from 1 to 411. And then... 1 to 411? Pick, pick a number. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. You're going to pick a number. <laughs> <laughs> and then that number is actually assigned to somebody's name out there. And then through sort of staffing magic, thank you so much to the National Public Housing Museum staff, Scott Lundius and Sue Enright, Will Rath, um, Tiff Beatty, Mark Jaschke, Shakira Johnson. Um, I want to really thank all of the staff for all of their work. And... Um, they, in that sort of magic, there's, they're going to actually tell, line up the number with the name, and then they're going to tell somebody else, and then they're going to pass it to us in an envelope. So, ready? ready? Say I'm a number ready. from 1 to 4 to 11. 102, okay. in honor of Tim. Woo! 102 years. Woo! Okay, Tim, can you say a number between 1 and 411? Pick any number. In a pick a number. Just pick any number between pick one and four hundred and eleven. Pick any number between what? One and four hundred and eleven. There's a lot of numbers. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> That's what one. I try to tell them. To Just pick one. Anyone. Eighteen. Mm. Eighteen. Eighteen. Mm. Eighteen. Mm. Eighteen. 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 What I consider the great day in history. Mm, say December more. the 7th, 1918. Your birthday. Mm. I was born. There you go. <laughs> oh, okay. A great day it was indeed. A great, a great day it was great indeed. Day. It was. We're so lucky. Yeah. All right. So those are the numbers. MPHM staff, right? Oh, so 18 <laughs> is very important. Yes. Yep. No, 100%. Um, all right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about storytelling and oral history, the methodology, one could say, but really just the practice that, you know, our answers, ancestors have passed down stories and history and the deepest, most provocative truths By the of way, our world. Studs Turkle. <gasps> Ooh, yes. Who Stutz. was a, a resident of this neighborhood for a long time mm -hmm. with a friend. Of Louis Armstrong, by the way, mm. <laughs> and Tim Black, mm. and he personified how having a common interest, a common game, or whatever you cross race lines, yep. gender lines, all over the line, and then he, he used that in oral history. Yes, he did. He popularized oral history. Yes, he did. He was a student, a law school student at the University of Chicago. Mm. Sturgeon was a great. Nobody paid attention to 
his race. Mm -hmm. He was so universal. Everybody loves studs. Yeah. He was so universal. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent. Now Eve and three or four of his books. But he loved Louis mm -hmm. Armstrong. He loved the music. Yeah. And, and he, I'm pretty sure he may have, because he he would. He, he, if Louis could be met, he would met him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we love Studs Terkel. Mm -hmm. And Eve, you actually worked with the Studs Terkel Archive and yeah. created a fascinating podcast. Can you say more? Sure, yeah. Well, um, as, as was mentioned, and for those who don't know, if you don't know who Studs Terkel is, you have to go look it up. But Studs Terkel was a radio host, of course, here in Chicago, and he hosted a show on WFMT for a really long time. And they have all these audio archives of all well, of his he interviews. Was a good friend of the Ayers family. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Yes, yeah. yes, of the Bill Ayers, of Ayers, the Ayers family. Yeah, shout out to Bill That's Ayers, our, our friend, <laughs> our, yes. our friend Bill Ayers. So for the Studs Terkel Radio Archive, we did um, a podcast called Bug House Square. When there are five episodes, people can check it out. It's hosted by me. Now, what I always said is a lot of people have a podcast, but I'm the only one who my co-host is a ghost because Studs is my co-host. So I think that's pretty cool. He's my co-ghost, if you will. And in every episode, thank you. And every episode of the podcast, we play a little bit of Studs interviewing somebody and then a little bit of me interviewing somebody in the present and we talk about it. So I feel really honored and grateful um, to Studs and his memory and his legacy and definitely is a big influence on me as a, as a storyteller. Yeah, and I love the podcast, my Eve. Oh, yeah, we have to have hot sauce. Hot sauce. Um, I love the podcast because it recognizes history in such a unique way because you draw the connections between a historical figure, an issue, a political context that was happening in, at some point, whether it was in the 60s or 70s or 80s, and then you talk to a contemporary activist who is also grappling with a similar issue, and there's like a kind of sense of how does that history inform the issue, and I think that's so important. Thanks, it's a lot of fun. And they were all friends of Margaret Burroughs. Yes. Oh! Yes, the legend, the yep. legend. Amazing Margaret Burroughs. Yep. Right. And for those who don't know, Margaret Burroughs founded the DuSable Museum, um, but she also was an educator, she was a prison educator, and she is the person who introduced Gwendolyn Brooks to her husband. Ooh, interesting. Yes, I love, and when you go um, to Stateville Prison, there actually is an amazing exhibit outside that's dedicated to Margaret Burroughs mm. and so many um, of the guys in there studied with her, you know, rabble roused with her and we're also thinking about all those guys who are in Stateville and she was just, as you said, one of the most incredible people that, you know, we were lucky to actually and have in our midst. And I was enough to be their dumb friend. <laughs> <laughs> we were all friends together across all of those physical divisive lines, we, that didn't even matter. We were friends because we shared a common hope yes. for the future. Yeah. And Studs, Margaret, all exemplified, inspiring Dr. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. to sing we shall overcome. Yeah. Now, what did you all like to do for fun when you would spend time together as friends? What did you all do? What would we do? Yeah, for fun. <laughs> Tell us to talk to each other, mm -hmm. wherever we would go, and laugh about the differences that people had, but at the same time respect those differences. Mm -hmm. We were universalists. Hmm. As the church that I, I'm a member of, the Unitarian Universal Church, we had that attitude that this is one world, let's bring it together. Hmm. And music was a very important. Louis Armstrong exemplified the unification tools that brought people together. Everyone knew about Louis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And food does that too, like you said. 
food brings people together. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I love the notion of a universalism that is really worthy of its name, mm-hmm. right? One which is not about homogenizing everything, but a universalism that See, can recognize all the differences. Ask the question of division. Why does race matter? Mm-hmm. Why does, if you divide people uh, along sexual, racial, ethnicity, mm-hmm. why, since we all, in the beginning, came from the same source, mm-hmm. 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 why do we allow those divisions, <coughs> biological divisions, to create it differences in talking about inferiority and superiority and mm-hmm. see, and what I try to do with younger people like yourself is let you know this is one world. Mm-hmm. Let's make it one world for all people, mm-hmm. peaceful. Mm-hmm. So we carry with my message. One more cup of coffee. All, All right. We by the way, that. I just want to say that this is Tim's third black cup of coffee mm-hmm. in the last hour. So this man can throw down he his coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and great. We're going to actually get, uh, who is it time now? Whenever. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, now I get to pick. Oh, what, 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 what time is it now, actually, literally? 6.56. Oh, no, don't make 656? it. 6.56? that late. We have to actually tell the winners. We don't. You're on camera, baby. Huh? You're on camera. Oh, and he looks a, good. Yeah, he looks this good. Is the real, yeah, that's real. all right. Okay. Yeah. You look good. Okay. Yeah. Don't go get in the trouble. But he's, he's, <laughs> the coffee's all <laughs> ready, so don't we're worry about big. it. Yeah. We're all good. Mm-hmm. Now, what we're going to actually do now is remember when you said the number 18? That number is sort of linked to this award Mm. which is going to be the great giveaway and Tim's sort of giveaway in here is going to be the dinner party cooking class with the amazing Tara Lane who had been the pastry chef at Blackbird um, and is now a food activist and um, works for Brodo Broth Um, and she is just one of the sweetest most brilliant people I know, and I just love you so much, Tara. Hello. <laughs> I just want to say thank to you. And I also just want to say she was also the one who made all of President Obama's uh, pies on inauguration evening. Mm-hmm. So um, she's a very cool person. And this is the person who's going to win that award. So I'm going to actually give it over. Do you want to open it up and read the name? Oh, the the Zenobia. Zenobia. The Zenobia. Zenobia. Do you want to do it? Okay. Okay. Meryl Smith. <gasps> Meryl Smith! Meryl Yay! Smith. Congratulations! Yes! Congrats, Meryl. Yes. Love Meryl Smith. She used to be the chair of the WBZ board Ooh, and is okay. a really wonderful cultural activist and also committed to um, a sort of healthy environmental justice and food in the city of Chicago. So, and love the winner. Meryl. Yes, yeah, and the winner. winner. All right, Big cool. Honor. Awesome. Okay, what is my, mine is for and yours other. is going to be for James Beard, award-winning chef and Michelin star restaurant parachute um, co-owners uh, Beverly Kim and also Johnny Clark. Um, and they have a very a quintessential dish that they make at the restaurant called Bing Bread. Mm. It's delicious. It has bacon and potato, and it's a mashup. That sounds good. Anyway, it's they're going to do a little cooking class and also talk to you about their activism. Who has won that yeah, award? Well, that's, it. That's, a, that's the end of it. That's the last coffee co- cup of coffee. You know, you know this food is good because every time you say something for like 30 seconds, I stop <laughs> Okay, the winner is Ernie Wong. Congratulations, Ernie Wong. Ernie Wong. Wong. Yay. 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 Congratulations, Ernie. Fabulous. All right. Well, we've actually come to this sort of, oh, this is so sweet. You guys are amazing together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway. All right, so I want to really thank all of you out there for joining us tonight. 
all of our hosts and all the people who've helped make this evening possible and also make the work of the National Public Housing Museum possible. I want to really thank you so much. It's so moving. It means so much that you all have, you know, contributed to us and our work at the National Public Housing Museum. And of course, I want to thank the extraordinary Eve Ewing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and also amazing Tim Black. Woo, yay! And thank you, Zenobia, for being here with us. And I also want to just um, thank everybody who helped tonight. So thank you so much. Take care. Um, good luck with your red beans and rice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where, where will this be? It's going to be on the internet. We're there right We're now. Live. We're live. We're live. They can see us. They can see us. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I 